Okay, on to the, the morning's plenary. Um, Brian Kim and Natasha Griffin, who have been, uh, I, I think for, Brian was sort of almost a new grad student at the last uh, all scientists meeting and a bit of a force of nature there. Um, and uh, Natasha and Brian had been leading the grad student committee for the last few years. I understand things are turning over this year, but they are gonna introduce our panel for this morning. Hi everyone, um, I'm Brian Kim. I'm with the Boat for Lagoon Ecosystem LTER. Uh, yeah, and I'm Natasha Christman. I'm with the uh, Arctic LTR um, and the other co-chair of the Graduate Student Committee. Um, so the theme of this AM, ASM and plenary um, is, of course, generations, um, which is quite a reflection word as a graduate student. Um, you know, as brand new researchers into the LTR ecosystem, we find ourselves picking up the thread of research 40 years on, uh, but just at the start of our own careers. And that's a that's a pretty wild place to be to suddenly find yourself um, with a tremendous foundation of research, um, you know, legacies that for some of these sites have actually been going on for decades. But of course, as a graduate student to know, um, you know, your thesis has to find something to research. Um, and there's a framework for that um, with the LTRs. Um, and of course, somebody has got to measure that chlorophyll um, in the decades to come. Oh, sweet. Um, so with that, I'm just going to do a quick introduction of all of our panelists, and then we'll get started. Um, so first off, I want to thank Evelyn Geyser for facilitating this discussion today. Um, Evelyn is an aquatic ecologist with the F Florida Coastal Everglades LTR with a focus on algae as sentinels of environmental change. In addition to her science, she really loves to incorporate humanities and social sciences into her collaborative science community. Um, first off, as our grad student um, representative generation, we have Zochi Claire. She is a PhD student at the Hoffman Lab at UC Santa Barbara and a member of the SBC LTER. Uh, with background and experience in both marine biology and the performing arts, Zochi really aims to increase public engagement in science advocacy through various interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, next, we have Dr. Forrest Isbell. Uh, Forrest is an associate professor in ecology, evolution, and behavior at the University of Minnesota and the director of the Minnesota Drive Environment. Uh, within the LTR network, he is a co-PI of Cedar Creek and a former associate director of the CCE Science Reserve. Um, and then last but not least, we have Dr. Ann Giblin. Um, Ann Giblin is a senior scientist and director of the Marine Biological Lab Ecosystem Center. She is an American Association Oh, she's an American Association for the Advancement of Science and Aldo Leopold Fellow. And within the LTR network, she has led the Plum Island LTR since 2008 and has been participating in the Arctic LTR for the past three decades. Um, also, just an extra plug for Anne Giblin. Uh, we are both biogeochemists and uh, we very much look up to you as like a role model in the biogeochemist world. And um, many of my mentors have were your students. So it's very cool to see all of us coming together again. Yeah, with that, please take it away. to do this whole thing. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome. So glad to see everybody at our last plenary. Um, what an incredible energy that we've had at this meeting and um, such a joy to be all together again. Um, just, just wonderful ideas um, all the way through. Uh, and this um, panel, I'm, I'm just so excited to hear from our three panelists that represent these different um, perspectives from different stages in their career and different uh, uh, durations of involvement in the LTER. And um, what we're gonna do is hear a little bit from each of them um, and their own uh, thoughts and perspectives. And then what we're really excited about is hearing from you. And so there are a couple of avenues for um, providing questions. One is to go onto your Sketch app and um, write questions directly uh, um, electronically and, and we'll read those out. Um, and then there'll be some microphones set up around. And I really wanna encourage the early career folks and graduate students to come with your questions about 
LTR to come with your thoughts about where you want to see the network heading into the future. And um, we're just really excited to get feedback today and a, and a nice discussion going on this generations topic. So, um, Anne, I think you're first up to give us your thoughts. Thanks everybody for the, the kind ways of saying that I'm getting pretty old. <laughs> um, so Marty had said she wanted to talk about generations and also reflect on the fact, what have we done right for 40 years and what do we have to think about going into our fifth decade? And we think about LTER, we think about the L and the T as long-term. But I like us to think a little bit about the L and the T as leadership and teams because those are, those are real challenges for any organization. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by telling a, a story that I hope, I hope works and I hope leads into some of the things we can think about. And back in 1997, uh, I was a child, um, I was talking with Diane McKnight and she told me she was going off to Florida with her kids. Um, and I said, great, you're going to Disney World? Her kids were pretty young at the time. She said, no, we're gonna watch the launch of the Cassini. I thought, well, her kids are a lot more um, interested in science than my kids, but it turned out that um, she said her husband had worked on Cassini for probably close to 10 years before the satellite was about to launch, and this was their kids' whole lives, and she wanted them to be there to see it, and also if, if the thing blew up on the pad, they were going to have to comfort him. <laughs> so fast forward about 20 years later, um, another secret is at one point I really wanted to be an astronaut. So I, I follow aspects of the space program. And I heard that Cassini was gonna be uh, plunged into Saturn. So I quick sent Diane a note and said, is your husband still involved in Cassini? And you know, how does he feel about it? And this and that. And she said, we're here at I think a Jet Propulsion Laboratory with our daughter and her husband. Um, and the whole crew is there and there's a lot of champagne and some tears and, um, and that's what happened. Cassini went into, into Saturn. So it was a tremendously successful 30-year program from start to finish that involved a huge team of people. That the, if you look at the NASA website, just before the thing had even launched, there were over 260 people involved in, in the mission and probably many more. Um, and there's a lot of people that probably spent their entire careers on that mission, but probably new people who came in and out. So that was 30 years. The LTER is going on 40 years. And we have the challenge of maintaining our teams, turning over our leadership, successfully passing things on, but also bringing in new ideas and new energy um, with this, you know, without becoming stale. So we have some challenges that NASA doesn't, doesn't have in the same way, right? We're much more um, dispersed. Many of our sites are made up of seven or eight institutions. Um, we don't have that sort of institutional focus on team building that some of the mission agencies have, like NASA. And in fact, I just want to reflect on a couple of issues in academia, maybe more broadly, that make this team building hard. Um, there's often not a lot of, of recognition or rewards for scientists that spend a lot of their time doing sort of team-related work. Um, as I've gotten older and older, I get more and more tenure files to review. And I've actually gotten some that the instructions are strongly consider the papers where the candidate is the first or the last author. And it was pretty clear that these 20 author synthesis papers that many of you poured your heart and souls into are not getting counted in the, in the same way. So I, I think that's a, a challenge, just a structural challenge we have. And it's a bigger challenge, even a bigger challenge, as we try to think about how we're going to increase diversity um, in our network, how we're going to be more inclusive, how we're going to address some of these issues. Um, I'm going to give you a statistic that I just heard last night that is kind of horrifying. Well, 80% of university professors come from 20% of the universities, and one in eight comes from only five institutions. So when we look at our professor pool, we're already strongly filtering out many people. We're already strongly limiting the diversity. So that leads to a challenge for us as LTERs. How can we bring in new people? 
how can we turn things over and bring in new ideas, increase diversity and equity in a face of a, um, a candidate pool that we don't have too much control over and institutions where we don't necessarily have too much control. Um, I don't want to say too much more. I just want to now sort of briefly touch on leadership because I think they're directly related. I think if we want to build strong teams and we want to increase uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, we're going to have to have strong leadership. Um, I think it was two ASMs ago, maybe, Peter, that you and I and a, a bunch of people were on a panel just talking about how do people get trained to be leaders. Um, and the, the outcome of the panel was the room was filled with graduate students and postdocs, but we didn't have a lot of answers. There's not really a lot of good leadership training available. Um, so I think as we go forward, I think we want to consider very strongly how we sort of perhaps tie these two things. If we're going to be increasing training and diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, we should couple that with giving people the tools of how to implement those plans. Um, I think it's all very doable, but I think it's going to take a very measured, a, a very deliberate approach to look at our sites, look at our leadership over the long term, think about how we're recruiting new people, think about how we're training them, and think perhaps less about grooming certain people for leadership rather than training everyone in leadership um, so that we can um, have a, a stronger site and a, a stronger network as well. So I think with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to Forrest. So I should have some slides here. I think we should. Yeah, slides, slides are coming. So I will say um, it was a bit of a surprise to be asked to represent or be a member of this middle generation. This is the first time um, it's contributing to a midlife crisis. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, it works. Oh, you want to do that. Okay. <laughs> yes, and I just want to emphasize this is a middle generation perspective, and I'm hoping during the Q and A we can hear from more, uh, more voices and more perspectives. We were asked to uh, describe. Uh, I don't think it's working here. Uh, this one's not working, so I'm going to use the arrows here. I'm sorry for the folks online might not be able to see that. Um, I'll keep trying this. Um, so we were asked to share a bit about our experience and interactions with the LTER network. And so just to walk through that, uh, oh, although the slides are not showing. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, I think it's working. <laughs> uh, I, I realized in preparing for this, um, this session that my first interaction with the LTER network was actually uh, as an undergraduate student using data from Kanza as part of an undergraduate pro course project. And so um, this, was, this was a great first experience. And after undergraduate, I taught high school for a while. And I also used data from Kanza, from other studies at Kanza as part of that teaching experience. And, and so then during graduate studies, um, what I have here is that I was not at Cedar Creek. Um, I applied to many graduate programs and Cedar Creek was actually the University of Minnesota was the one program I didn't get into. Um, and so I mentioned that because I think that's also a common experience that many of us have is, is we try to engage with organizations or groups and it doesn't always work out. Um, and then during my first postdoc, I said, you can't keep me away. I'm going to go ahead and use some data from Cedar Creek as part of my postdoc, even though I was not at Cedar Creek, I was in Canada um, for that first postdoc. 
And then finally, I got my foot in the door at Cedar Creek for a second postdoc, uh, was able to work in this long-term fertilization study that started the year I was born. Um, and then in my first faculty position, I was at the University of Georgia, and I tried to get my foot in the door at Coweta, and that didn't work in the short time that I was um, at the University of Georgia, that also didn't work. Um, and I, then I, after a brief time at Georgia, I came back to Minnesota and started in a non-faculty administrative position uh, there at Cedar Creek, thinking more about the buildings and the staff and the budgets, um, and was able to transition back into uh, a faculty position and continue on with research. And so you may be confused, why am I showing this picture of uh, Maria here? I don't work at Maria, but I still aspire to work at Maria. And <laughs> And I attended a science council meeting in 2016 and Russell gave this phenomenal talk about the work that was going on at Morea. And I asked him, can I use those slides when I teach ecology? And I've continued to read every paper that's coming out of Morea and I'm still hoping someday uh, to add that. But we were asked uh, to comment on what is what are the most important aspects to preserve of this uh, LTER program? And I would say that we should first think about each of the individual sites. And so I can't speak on behalf of all sites. At Cedar Creek, uh, my perspective would be that we should focus on preserving these long-term experiments, which are the longest running of their kind in the world. But I suspect we would have different answers at each of these sites. And that's, that's good to think about. Um, at the network level, I started thinking, what should we keep? And I started thinking, well, what? how are we organized? And I looked at the website and there's actually this wonderful figure that or shows how we're organized across the network. And I thought this would be good um, for everyone to take a look at in case you're feeling like you're not sure how all the pieces fit together. I think this uh, conceptual figure does a nice job of organizing that. And so there's some standing committees. Um, there's an LTR network office, EDI, and there are synthesis working groups uh, that are supported through the network communication office that brings together researchers. There's uh, lead PIs coming together for science council meetings annually. There's the um, all scientist meeting. Let's see. Yes, there's the all scientist meeting, which is not a part of this figure, but which is how we're interacting with one another right now. Uh, and so there's lots of strength here. And I would actually say these things are functioning really well, and I would like to see these continue. I think the network uh, office does a phenomenal job, not just organizing conferences like this, but also these other activities and coordinating these other activities. And then what changes would you like to see? Uh, for me, these are additions. I, I thought critically about whether I should, we should or whether I'd recommend that we remove any of these components, and I, I don't recommend that. And of course, this isn't welcome for people to say we should do more without you know, an increase in budget, but we'll talk about that in a moment, um, how to increase the budget. So what's conspicuously absent though from this diagram for me is early career researchers. And I don't know exactly what the best option would be, but I think we need to work harder to bring together early career researchers. As a former postdoc in the network, uh, that can be a stage where you feel disconnected at your own institution to other postdocs, and this network provides a critical mass of people across sites uh, to engage with and collaborate with, and there's some lasting relationships that have come for me through the All Scientists meeting in past, uh, past years. And I would also add synthesis postdocs to these working groups. Most of the successful synthesis centers in the world support postdocs is part of those. And I was happy to learn at this meeting, there's already work underway to do this, to add uh, postdocs to these synthesis working groups. And the last thing I would add to this figure is, is to emphasize a point that was made in the decadal review, we need to diversify the lead PIs. And I think without some strategy for doing this, this won't, this won't happen. Um, we have a lot of inertia in our, um, in our network. And so I think we should think creatively about the structures and the way that we want to have co-mentoring you know, opportunities uh, and, and actually change the way we're doing things so that that actually happens. Uh, the, the decadal review emphasized these two main points, advancing DEIJ and offering solutions is two things we should really think about for this next decade. And I strongly wholeheartedly agree that those should be two uh, major priorities. I, 
have a couple examples of that shown up here in these pictures, ways that we could do that. Um, but the first plenary did a much better job than I could of addressing uh, this first point. And so I, and for the sake of time, I will, I will just move forward here. Um, I also think we need to open the LTER community. I have many friends and former supervisors who have felt left out of this network. And I think there's many people out there who don't feel like they are part of this club. And I think we really need to work on that. And so this could come just a couple of examples here of ways that we could think about growing the network or engaging with other networks. But I think we really critically need to work hard on this. And then more intangible things. I, I want this network to feel more like this picture on the right and less like this picture on the left. And of course, you can take metaphors too far. Those of you who work in the ocean might be nervous about this. Um, but I, I would say that we're on this journey moving from left to right here. And But I would also say I think we have a long, long ways to go. And so I think we should keep in mind that we want this to feel fun and pay attention to how we feel when we're a part of this community and doing this work. And so I'll just wrap up here by saying, if we think about these trees as being generations, at first I thought this was deforestation. I was really <laughs> worried about this tree here. Um, but I see, I see in the generation before me, a lot of wisdom. And I see in the generation after me, a lot of wisdom. And these are complementary uh, sources of wisdom. So I honestly think from the middle here, we need to be listening uh, in both directions. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. And I think we have energy to do it. I think we're not as old as we look or as we feel some days. Uh, so we will we will get this done. So I've listed just a few specific things here, but I want to stop there. Thanks. Let's start by saying that last diagram was excellent. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. It is such an honor to be the F3. <laughs> Uh, that's so fantastic, and um, I really appreciate this meeting, and I really appreciate all of you, and I hope, as we mentioned before, that this is just the start of the conversation. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about myself. At this conference, I'm sure you all have started to hear this word, interdisciplinary, intersectional, lots of variables, but basically that just means that we're all multifaceted and it's about time that we embrace that. And it's about time that we embrace that in our science. And myself, I uh, have a lived experience of being Afro-Latina. I am first generation. My family comes from Belize and Jamaica and life at sea is interwoven in our culture. The way that I learned about the ocean was through the stories of my family. While I didn't really spend much time in the ocean or studying it or you know, until I got to college, it was the stories that really held me to nature. So as a marine biologist and a performing artist and a filmmaker, I combine the power of science and performance and those stories to better understand the world around me. This cross-disciplinary lens that I've been cultivating, I think actually this, oh, here we go. There we go. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. So um, my cross-disciplinary lens is something that I've been de developing over the course of my PhD. I have always been an artist, but over the course of my PhD, I am now an ecophysiologist. And that only bolsters my ability to do the work that I do. Finally, as I mentioned before, by collecting along the way stories from our stakeholders, I'm able to do better science that's more applied. Uh, and this is kind of like my diagram, like of me. So if you could only imagine splitting your brain between these things, it seems very difficult to be interdisciplinary. And the, it is. And because we think about interdisciplinariness as kind of just sitting next to someone who's from a different discipline and kind of having them do that part of the work, we often approach interdisciplinariness in the wrong way. I, over the course of my career, have been really trying to dip my toe in these different places to try to better come up with ways to look at our environment. So the way I do that is by investigating the effects of marine heat waves on early stages. And we'll talk more about how that really connects with all the work we do here in the LTR. 
Um, and I also engage local stakeholders through a lot of the media making that I do. Marine heat waves are something that I think in California, we have a strong intuitive sense of the rising temperature on the West Coast is, is very obvious. And so the question about marine heat waves is thinking about the future, climate change, and how a long-term ecological data set could really prepare us to ask these questions in a better way. And so a lot of my work is grounded in the work of the SBC that has charted the warm water blob in the past and also continues to monitor our warm water changes in the future. And so we're all aware of what's happening. And I think we're at the stage where we know that we're going to need every generation to participate in the next steps to mitigate climate change. And I just wanna kind of walk you through a little bit of how I go about using LTER data in my ecophysiology work. Uh, marine heat wave is something that we now can simulate in lab settings. And so in this diagram, you'll see a lab simulation of a marine heat wave that I've kind of induced in the lab and basically have started to see how that might affect a local fish species, which is on the right of uh, the Kellett's Walk, focusing on how might we be able to more mimic what's going on in the environment. And that's been the focus of my PhD. And as we know, with long-term research, it kind of continues. We have many folks in our lab kind of taking the mantle here. In looking at climate change, we know that there are a lot of different aspects that are in the environment that we can't always represent in the lab. So a lot of our lab-based work is also complementary to the ecosystem work that we're doing through the LTR. And finally, uh, the question, what would you like to see 10 years from now was what we were asked um, for this plenary. And this is a very difficult question. Um, these past two years have shown us, you know, we're really fragile. Um, not only just as scientists, our work took a turn for many people, we could not have predicted that. Um, so maybe two years from now, if you asked me what would I like to see in 10 years from now, I might have had a different answer. So I'm hoping that given what we've experienced, how we've all changed, we can really reflect on this a little bit more in a different way and honor the human parts of ourselves moving forward. I really wanted to talk to my peers about this. Unfortunately, I didn't have as much time, but I'm really grateful for some of the folks from the SBC, SBC who took the time during this meeting to engage this topic. And in talking with more F3 people, it's not really a, what would you like to see? It's more like, what will we see? Because the energy is so strong for change. We talked about increasing diversity, I don't think it's an if anymore, it is a will because we are all here and every year we see more and more diverse faces. So I decided to rephrase this question. Here is what we will see. And there are a couple of things that I wanna walk through and I, I do want this to be a continued brainstorming. Folks from the SBC were saying they wanted to see, they will, we will see an integration of evolutionary ecology and adaptation. So. That means that while we are looking at long-term data, we also need to be thinking about rapid evolution, and adaptation, and might I even say mitigation? I know. Um, Cross-site graduate student collaboration will happen. I mean, over the past two years, we had to communicate over Zoom. That was crazy. Uh, we, co we connected our Google calendars across time zones to get things done. So that means we will see cross-site graduate student collaboration. Also, interdisciplinary and applied research, it has to happen because all of the things that we're discovering right now is it's not, oh, what will happen in terms of ocean rise or what will happen in terms of temperature rise, it's happening. So in 10 years from now, we will see interdisciplinary applied research. We will see more storytelling. Um, last night, there was tons of that, and I'm so proud to see that. That was wonderful. 
And in order for us to be together in this, we need to hear each other. We need to hear each other's stories, each other's different academic perspectives. So there will be more interdisciplinary and applied research. We will see cross experimental site work. And that was the point made by someone saying, well, there are biogeographical range expansions and, and, and habitat contractions that are happening as a result of climate change. So how are you supposed to understand that if we're just at our own sites? So that means that in 10 years, that will definitely happen. Site to site standardization, professional development, program structures and sampling. In these areas, we do need to be standardized. We are a collective, a collective mind now with the advent of social media and online communication. And we need to collectively protect each other in the field. We also need to ensure that there is a standard for prof professional development. Um, essentially, 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 because there needs to be a career track. I think that, that statistic that you mentioned about the small percentage of schools that we're recruiting from to, you know, pile into our faculty pipeline, that will not cut it for the things that we need to accomplish in the next 10 years, which means that all of the wonderful golden nuggets that we've been talking about, the mentorship that I'm just seeing happening right and left, it's fantastic. And I think that's something that all of our sites have. So we will standardize it. We will come together and we will find a way to spread the love. Um, it's definitely necessary. And I'm so glad that my peers shared this with me. Um, hopefully there'll be more perspectives that we'll talk about. Um, one that I wanted to add that's not here is outside academic collaboration because that pins on professional development. Businesses, museums, all of these you know, entities need us as academics. I mean, I think we're being asked to participate in a way that we haven't before as scientists and they really do need us to make the right decisions. So, in terms of professional development, why not loop them in so that the F3s can start to be the ambassador and have those scary conversations with businesses. And hey, some of them aren't too bad. The Smithsonian is fantastic. And I think already a lot of us are working with these groups. So why not bring in them into our long-term network family? Those are the final things that I have to say. Um, I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I really do appreciate having you all here. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much for such inspiring presentations. It's so exciting to hear from you and um, and and I hope that this uh, these presentations uh, raise some questions that you'd like to ask of our panelists. Um, the microphones, I believe, are distributed. Are they? Oh yes, I see them here along the middle. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So um, please be thinking about questions and put them into your Sketch app or um, come up to the microphone. And uh, maybe while we do that, I, I, I have one. Um, I think you each men mentioned the power of effective mentoring in helping build new leadership and LTER, expand our uh, diversity at different levels. Um, I just wondered your your perspectives on what uh, the most effective mentoring might look like um, in a formal way. Of course, we we do a lot of um, different types of mentoring uh, at different levels um, in 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 our sites. But uh, if we had a cross site mentoring program, what might that look like that that would be most effective in meeting those goals? <clears throat> All right. Uh... Is this mic on? Oh, great. No, I'm seeing yes and no. So that's not, not really hearing you as well as. <laughs> okay, testing, testing. We're okay. All right. Um, yeah. So this, I think, this is a great question. I definitely don't have the answer for what is the best option, but some good options. I know there's an entering mentoring training happening tomorrow. Um, I think I think that's fantastic. I know that that's more focused on on training early career. Uh, you know, early career mentoring. I, I've also heard people comment at this meeting on thinking about uh, 
co-leadership models for different LTER sites and how that can be an effective way to pass that torch, you know, with some uh, teams of leadership working together with insight. So those are two quick comments. Mm -hmm. uh, to answer that question, what is the best way that we can start to work together to figure out how to mentor across sites and standardize that? Um, at our site at UCSB, and I'm sure many other sites, we have RUs, we have a specifically at our site Fuerte, which is a undergraduate support a program, five-year program. And in that program, we started to train our mentors, specifically our undergraduate our graduate student mentors and working with their undergraduates and thinking about all the things that we've learned. There are plenty of resources out there that have come over the past two years for best practices for mentoring in DEI spaces, specifically the geoscience literature is actually really, really strong and has many, many years under its belt. So I think at all of our sites, we do have these kinds of programs. Um, so it would be kind of going from site to site within our REUs, finding out what works, really talking with our graduate students because they're the ones that have the one-on-one -on -one interaction with the undergrads and priming them. So I guess if we were to collectively do this um, stealing from our program intentionally, if we do it intentionally, meaning not just rolling into mentoring, but actually sitting down and writing out our goals and thinking about it, I think over time in 10 years, we all might have a really strong, amazing list of things that we do and could potentially share that across our sites. I think it it takes um, this more senior level. It it takes two things. One, it takes the senior people to let go a little bit and actually let the younger people have more responsibility without sort of overburdening them. And then I think the other thing is groups like this where we can talk to each other and and sort of form some ideas on how to do things are really really valuable. So I I think I wouldn't underestimate the importance of peer to peer mentoring sort of at every career stage. Beautiful, thank you. Um, questions from the crowd or comments? Um, we actually feel have free to questions. offer your own perspective. We have some questions on, from the Zoom. Wonderful. Um, so and I think that there's one on the crowd that maybe we'll do that one and then the ones online. <clears throat> Go ahead, Nancy. Sure. Um, I found really, I barely have Thank you, Nancy. Great idea. <clears throat> Great. We have some from the Zoom. And sure. also, we have a request from the Zoom to if you could repeat the questions from the audience so oh, they can sure. hear them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we have several questions. But the first is um, Do you all have any suggestions for early career scientists on ways to stay connected to the LTR network uh, if and when they wind up working outside of it in the future? So. I think we would need to feel a sense of ownership. I think that's key to that, right? It's important for us as early career people to remember that we will be mid-career and further along a lot sooner than we think. So <laughs> time flies, everybody. <laughs> and the sooner we take ownership of what we see around us, it'll be a lot easier to reach out and genuinely ask questions. Um, why is it this way? How did this get started? Sometimes that's just the first step. And so when you see folks around you who are running around organizing things or doing things and maybe you don't really know who they are, I would say that that's the first place to start and start to see yourself in that future role of leading someone and designing the world that you want to see. I think that's the best way because there are actually quite a few people within the LTR network that we can learn from as early career people and likewise can learn from us, but we have to have those conversations. So 
the nuts and bolts of just exchanging information. If you met someone who actually you kind of resonate with or when they spoke, they said something that was interesting to you, definitely reach out. Um, you'd be surprised at if you follow your your gut in terms of what you want to see and finding those people, that will definitely happen. So the people that you, um, I don't know, jammed out with last night at one of the musical sessions, before you know it, both of you will be mid-career and you will be in the place to start an REU at your site. And you two maybe are different sites, but you know, you can collaborate and create that REU in the way that you two see it in that way. So that's what I would suggest. Thank you, Casey. Would, would either of you, Anne or, or um, Forrest, like to come in? <clears throat> um, I, I think, um, you know, we don't necessarily think of our LTERs the way universities think of themselves with having alumni and things like that. But, but we, you know, we the high LTR, we've had a lot of boomerang students. You know, they, they're with us, they go away for a while, and then they come back. And I think just maintaining some correspondence and connection with them throughout their careers so that they can think about coming back or sending somebody else back is is the probably the easiest way to do it. And I would just say for my part, um, from my experience, building relationships uh, and collaborations with people has really kept me engaged in the network. And so I, I think one of my early experiences was working groups led by Kim Komatsu and Megan Avolio and Kevin Wilcox. And we stayed in touch, you know, but those those synthesis working groups can also be a good way to build community. And um, and then last night, the storytelling event that Clarice organized was a different a different level of, of building community because it, it made me feel more part of this community you know, to hear other people's stories. Great. I like thinking about how we can most effectively help people boomerang <laughs> in the LTR. Neat. Question. <clears throat> We're not hearing you that well. Um, Yeah, I th thank you for that question. I think it's a really important question. And I just want to start by saying that I think the reason we should engage with uh, traditional ecological knowledge and in indigenous communities is not for the benefits that we get back from it, but because it's the right right thing to do, honestly. And and yet it would be a huge missed opportunity if we failed to to make those engagements as well. So the things we value in this network, you know, long-term knowledge that's place-based is is much richer in these indigenous communities and so how do we go about doing this i think this is about relationship building um at cedar creek we i can say we made a mistake we reintroduced bison and then tried to engage tribal communities in the area uh in that process and we've had grace from uh some of these dakota community members who are now giving us another chance to sort of restart that process in collaboration with them. But it's, t it's taken years and it's taken a lot of grace and patience on their part. And I think this is, this is what it takes. It takes long periods of time building relationships. And I do wanna say that I think people in that middle generation have a particularly important role to play here because you're somewhere, hopefully for a while, uh, and you have time to build these relationships. Yes, and as F3s, we have even more time to build those relationships. Um, and that relationship, I believe, starts with yourself and how you cultivate your own culture of respecting your environment. And I don't mean that in an activist way. I mean that in a self way. Um, so oftentimes, um, I have, I've had the honor to actually speak um, at our university while working with UC Santa Barbara with our local tribal leaders in the Chumash Nation. And oftentimes they are belabored with, a lot, as we, we, we heard before, um, with a lot of requests of us trying to collaborate with them and things of that nature. And I, and, you know, uh, our tribal elder um, Mia Lopez shared with, with us that we should look deeply 
why do you want to have a relationship with the indigenous people where you live? And ask that within your network, ask that within your group and ask that within yourself and do the personal research. Um, the history that we that we have is is beautiful as well as sometimes very very dark and um i think i although we want to sometimes move away from that so quickly i think we kind of move to that next step without actually pausing to understand um what the complexities are and all, once again um all of that information is there there's a lot of historical information and as we scientists approach our own work we do spend a lot of time in literature so Again, there is a lot of literature that was referenced here. We should just take the time and it might be scary to do alone. It's a hard thing to do alone. I think we should be doing it within our own labs, within our own groups. We should be doing it together um, to make that step together. Um, and I think kind of going along with a specific question is how are we going to do our work well that way? I think that um, we, was as was said by our keynote, uh, the youth are essential, right? So our tribal elder sat us down. We were all graduate students and she told us, each of you have been to college. Sit with how amazing that is. Sit with how wonderful that is and think about the indigenous folks that don't have that opportunity. Also sit with all the, the fact that there are many young indigenous folks that can't even see themselves as college bound and start to think about maybe walks that you can do, you know, just nature walks, small things, and build that relationship, build the trust, because there's a lot of mistrust, and there needs to be a lot of time spent in rebuilding that. So before we go in and, you know, come up with this amazing plan and, and start up with a, you know, outreach program and finding the funding to do so, it's really small things that can really help build the relationship. And then those wonderful projects will come and they'll come in a way that's even more general, gen genuine and amazing that you could have originally imagined. So that would be my suggestion. I'll, I'll be very short, but I think the, the short answer is it's gonna take a lot of time. And I also think within our sites, we if we're gonna take this seriously, we wanna have someone who's doing this, but not different people dropping in and out all the time. I think the the people want to have a relationship with uh, the LTER, but they don't want to have people just sort of helicoptering in and out. So I think it's just going to take a lot of time. Our, our area is a little bit complex because not everybody agrees which group was on what land and all of that sort of stuff. But I think it just is going to be uh, making sure that someone is engaged in that, but in, in a way where they're doing more listening than talking. Thank you so much for your perspectives on such an important um, um, topic that I hope we continue that uh, conversation um, throughout this meeting and beyond. Um, other questions? I see one there. <clears throat> wow, thank you so much for sharing that perspective. Um, in other disciplinary stories are data. <laughs> and and so um, in the world of thinking about diversity and equity questions in the academic space and the social sciences, we use testimony. And there's so much literature on that of collecting students' experiences of advantage versus disadvantage and quantifying that in a different kind of more qualitative way. So there is literature on that. If you can dig into that, and really integrate that into your scientific mission, um, I'd be happy to share these resources with people. Um, it's really a powerful way to start that um, in say a proposal of some kind um, to really first line out what is narrative? What does that mean? How does that encode an experience? And how does that really show you know, what this maybe diversifying ecology program can give to people. Um, and that's something that I, I've definitely done. It is hard because you usually have a limited space in your proposals and you wanna get all your good science things in. So in order to articulate yourself well, it's the, it's the literature and the social sciences on these topics that we're actually talking about that's actually really strong.
Yeah, thank you for that comment. I I just want to reiterate that I think we can't afford to not learn from these stories because we have seen many times in our own data how our perspective gets updated over time as we our studies go for longer and longer periods of time. We see something in a completely new way and we have to we have to respect that each person's carrying their own life journey with them and also that there's intergenerational knowledge that's passed through the generations and lessons that can be learned from that. And so I, I think we can't afford to not engage with, with stories in a really rigorous manner. I think we also have to protect stories that aren't meant to be shared, you know, and I think not all stories are meant to be shared. And so the challenge for me is actually learning from stories and having an updating science and not trying to test stories. You know, if somebody gives a good perspective, it's not time to go test that perspective with a new experiment necessarily. And it's not always time to share that story. And so, so I, I think partly for me, this means that we need verbal communication amongst one another and that it, it won't all show up in the primary literature and there can be learning that's outside that space. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I have anything to add to that, except again, it comes down to being respectful of what is yours to share and what is not. And we, we would not consider our understanding of a site complete without knowing the legacy. And this is another, another kind of legacy that we, we need to understand. Thank you. Great question, Namir, thank you. Other Still got questions? more coming in on SCAD all the time. Wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, every long-term project has legacy and norms, beneficial and not. Are there legacies you see that are no longer serving us that you'd like to see us let go of? Legacies we'd like to let go of. <laughs> well, I mean, I think education has changed, right? I mean, it used to be much more hierarchical, um, less welcoming. Um, I think we still have a lot of work to do, but I think we have made progress. So I would sort of like to see the legacy of, uh, for want of a better word, I'm going to call it academic elitism, um, as well as sort of discrimination. I'd like to see those legacies go away. You spoke well to that in, in your presentation as well. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Anything in the room um, before we go to the next question? Uh, yeah, what we'd like to hear from you guys if yeah. you guys have any thoughts. Yeah. So. For sure. Yeah, feel free to make comments and, and thoughts on the questions that have already been asked. Uh, the next question is, uh, what do you think is the best way to retain students from historically excluded groups? So I, I would love to know the answer to that question. I think that we're not always, um, you know, we're, we're focusing often on the academic side of it, and that's maybe not where the the problem lies. If if a student doesn't feel included, doesn't it feels different, um, it, it's an issue. Um, I think it can be for economic reasons. It can be for reasons of race or color or religion or whatever, but if, if you feel like you really stand out and you don't belong, it's just an uncomfortable feeling. And I, I don't know exactly how we we get around that, how we how we can improve we need to improve the the climate. Yeah, I would just add, I think there's not one answer to that question because there people are different. And and so I think there are different reasons why people will um, not feel included or feel excluded or marginalized. And I think I just want to agree that I think inclusion is the key. And I think we should be proactive in preparing spaces for for the diversity that we know is, is growing. Uh, and we're thankful that is growing. But we need to prepare our spaces on the inclusion side. That's not a specific answer, but it's on purpose not specific because I think it's many things. And I think we're learning together what those are. Um, well, the geosciences STEM kind of studies have shown a few things specifically that has 
worked in terms of retaining students of diverse backgrounds. Largely, it includes uh, hands-on and hands-on hands-on stuff. We at the LTR, you know, have all of that, and it's because in out the outside classroom setting. It allows for people to connect in a different way. And we all know that. We see that all the time when we're in the field and we connect with our mentors or mentees in a different way. And that's a lot of times where students shine and they can show different aspects of their, their you know, their, their wonderful qualities of leadership or communication skills or organization skills. And so that's one way we can do inclusive ecology work at all of our sites. Um, mainly also seeing people who look like them. Um, and if you don't necessarily have that at your LTR site, um, what we often do is we bring people in and we connect people with people who might inspire them in a different way as they share maybe different axes of different intersectional identities and things of that nature. I know that's definitely how I moved through. Um, many of my mentors would just ping me, hey, look at this person's work or just a link this is a cool podcast about this person doing this thing that you also seem like you might want to do. And so in small ways we can do it, but um, across the board, definitely holding on to field-based activities and maybe a lot of our barriers that we have for, you know, let's say an academic record, we might want to consider uh, looking more at soft skills is not soft, but at least essential, they're essential. Um, to be a good scientist and really looking at those as wow you know this person in their statement does not necessarily have all of these prerequisites but they do show in different axes of their life wow they've overcome a lot they must have had to have a lot of really great leadership skills to do that and self-motivation and self-determination and application those things make a good scientist so when we readjust and look at things a little bit differently that's when we're able to include people who have been historically excluded Wonderful. So G, you also mentioned um, a few questions ago, the importance of feeling a sense of responsibility and um, ownership uh, to your LTR site. And um, there are so many different ways where uh, we might work on, on helping everybody feel that. And I know for me and coming through um, my early career, uh, having um, peers that, uh, that I could interact with in um, both formal and informal kind of social settings uh, was extremely important for building those bonds that then um, um, last and, and make a difference to your own uh, sense of belonging. And so um, just being cognizant that there are formal and sort of these uh, informal ways that we can do that. Yeah, yeah just to add one more thing to that. there. Um, we had a meeting and someone pointed out that um, if you're an advisor and a mentor of a student and you sit down and you start having a conversation, you can figure out within two to three minutes how much the student has read, you know, and what their, um, how much background and experience and knowledge they have in the area that you're, you're having a discussion on, if it's within your, your area of research. And likewise, many early career people are much more knowledgeable and experienced in terms of DEIJ expertise. Mm -hmm. And often students can learn within two to three minutes <laughs> how much you've done your homework and learned and and taken the time to understand. And so I, I think to those in the room like me who have a lot of privilege, doing the homework and actually spending the time is worthwhile if we want to retain uh, diversity in our communities. And, and this is not, um, and so an example, that you could do that's actionable is take bystander intervention training uh, through the advanced geo program. And I know many of you in this room have already done this, um, but, but this is a way that we can start as a community seeing things that we didn't otherwise see in terms of bias and discrimination, and then starting to be more vocal, um, calling people out when, when necessary and calling people in when possible. And one final thing I'd like to add, and I see we have a question in the back. Um, is financial support. Uh, it's just that our field sometimes isn't attractive to those who have financial hardship. It's very hard to stay within ecology um, with potentially the thought that, oh, maybe I will I get a job out of this? Is this financially sustainable for me? So we need to show students along the way from the very beginning, from the very beginning that they come into your group, that they will be financially supported. And if that's not feasible within your own 
I guess, academic budget. There are tons now, even I think growing every day, uh, scholarships and financial opportunities for students in ecology of diverse backgrounds. And so if we can upfront, make sure that students know that this is a place where they can actually be supported, not just in the ways of sense of belonging, sense of belonging can really just be this is, too, I can't afford this, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe even loaning gear out. Sometimes I remember in the early stages of my career, when I heard that I needed a sleeping bag, I Googled the, you know, how much it costs. And I honestly was like, I don't know if I can go. My mom had to talk me into actually asking my peers if who could loan me a sleeping bag. I'm so glad that she did. Um, but those are the, the small things that can just feel like it's kind of hard to, to say, like, I need help in this financial way. So we can help people by bringing that to them first without having them to have to come to us. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Um, we can all be more intentional in how we think about um, embracing uh, the diversities in our, in our programs. Yes, question in the back. Is there a microphone back there? Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, going beyond, so the diversity is not very, not out of time, but it's beyond time. It's thinking about, thinking intensely about the skills, things, systems, and raising involved in the research and things for social media, trying to be thinking about other skills, go beyond, and how I'm thinking, you know, beyond the skill of the The question was how we can think about uh, skills that we're teaching in a, in a short-term thing that go beyond research. And um, I, I really feel that anybody who does anything would benefit from sort of a hands-on research experience because we're all making decisions about things that are related to research, right? We're deciding whether or not to get another booster. Uh, we're looking at climate change. So... I just think the more people can have an authentic experience in science, the better citizens that they will become and, and the better chance we'll have of, of solving some of these problems. So um, if I have a undergraduate student that's involved in something and they say they don't think they're necessarily gonna go into science, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, I think it, it's, it's actually good for us to have people who are not just gonna go into science. I think the way that we can embed this into our programs is to start by building outside science partnerships within our groups and within our LTR sites. So oftentimes now we're seeing, you know, NSF, I believe if it is the includes or grows, at least provided um, graduate students an opportunity to do an internship with an outside partner, say the Smithsonian, a local museum, an NGO. And especially for students of um, underrepresented backgrounds, it's important to see that what I'm doing, which is taking a big leap about what, outside of what I'm comfortable in, is going to pay back my community. It's going to pay back my, my you know, direct impact. The science that I'm doing, I need to see the direct impact of it. And so from early on, even, you know, early on undergrad, all the way through for early careers specifically, we really do need to show the application of what we're doing. If you do have people who you know have been successful outside of academia, bring them in to talk to your students. Um, there are always NGOs and volunteer groups and museum spaces, education spaces, even um, NGOs with small legal outshoots, the Nature Conservancy, Conservation International. We're all connected to all of these places and people, and they need to be a part of our process so our early career people can see that what we do every day has a real application. Whether or not you become a scientist, we need you to stay focused in this, in this realm to make change. And I think by really pushing our partnerships a bit more, I know we at the, you know, at the upper, midder, 
mid mid or stage uh we have these partnerships but it's also about sharing it and bringing it down because that's the way we'll see retention and that's also the way we'll see more engagement yeah i don't have much to add but i do want to just um agree there's an nsf intern program and I think there are multiple programs, but the intern program is one I just learned about this year. And a graduate student, Maggie Anderson, who's who's here somewhere, um, is currently one of these NSF fellows working with um, TNC, with the Nature Conservancy. And so this is a great way for graduate students to add on fellowships to existing funding projects that you already have funded and get experiences outside of academia and test the waters and maybe get their foot in the door in an agency or an NGO that they'd like to work with. I just wanted to strongly agree. Wonderful. I know I met a student this week, I hope it's okay to say, who is in our REU program who said, well, I found out this summer that maybe research isn't the thing for me, but I can't wait to write about it. And um, how wonderful. And we have programs here to um, help uh, students learn how to do that. So um, a question in the back. I see a hand up. Um, way in the back. Oh, sorry. Is there one in the front as well? We have about five more minutes. So I think we could probably take two more. <clears throat> yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful. Connecting on the personal level is so important. And I love that we have a newbie sticker at this meeting. And so pay attention to that. And let's make sure that uh, all of our newbies feel um, like they're old bees or something at the end of the meeting. <laughs> Another question in the back here. I think I saw a hand up. Wonderful. Thank you. Another question from, or here's one up here. Um, let's see. Brian? Um, so, Kind of going in line with the theme of generations and also a lot of the mentoring talk that we've been kind of doing. I wanted to ask the three generations that are currently up there. Um, one of the big overarching things that the grad student, the grad student committee often talks about is what services or what does the LTR network provide that kind of distinguishes itself from what you might get at the home institution. So I was kind of wondering in the scope of mentoring and developing early career scientists within the LTR network, what do you guys feel like within your generation the LTR did well? Like, what does a scientist do? What makes them what makes them special? Are they really good at collaborating with a bunch of people? Are they really good at setting up massive experiments in the field? So, I kind of want to for our generation as we enter the workforce, how can we distinguish ourselves and how can we leverage that LTR connection to kind of say we are good at these things because the LTR network has provided us. The support to so what makes the LTR network experience unique? I'll just be very short, but I think there's two things. I think if you work as a graduate student with a single principal investigator, you know your topic and everyone in your lab knows your topic really well. Whereas if you're an LTER, you are still working with somebody that knows their topic and other students, but you might be a biogeochemist and then you're out in the field and you're talking to somebody who's working on beetle dispersal and things like that. So I, I think for one thing, you get a broader training in, in ecosystems, ecology and all that it is. And the other thing is I think you do, um, it, most LTRs have to do teamwork. And that's, I think, really important for success later on. Yeah, and I would add to that that I think I think because of the long-term data, we actually get closer to the right answer sometimes for some of these big questions. Maybe that's overstated, but I honestly believe it. And, and I think it also gives a perspective as you're starting out your career and trying to think what big studies do I wanna set up that will last decades? You've thought through some of those things. You've seen some of those opportunities, not just at the sites you've worked, but other sites at meetings like this, exchanges with people. And it's a different perspective on on what's possible through the course of your career than maybe a longer term perspective. 
I couldn't agree more with the two responses. And I think in leveraging that as you move in to your next step is super important. Um, showing that you can think that way, the way that we often as early career people get that opportunity is through proposals. So I think really showing your capacity to think through um, in writing is really good. Um, I, but I do believe that it's important um, probably at our stage for early career to show not only the long-term ecological thinking, but the long-term social ecological thinking, I actually think that might be our add-on for our generation because we might need to be able to show case, okay, I've thought through this long-term, you know, in this way, maybe I'm not um, necessarily, you know, all of these disciplines, but I can look through all these different lenses as a scientist, but also I can think about the social ecological impacts because climate change does have that. And that's kind of a component of all of our work now. So I don't think you have to become a social ecological scientist or a social scientist, but I do think that we should also be pushing ourselves a bit further um, coming into the next gen, uh, actually engaging with some of that in our work. Wow, what a wonderful question and comment to end our session on today. Um, I would add that one of the unique things about LTER is that we can have these open conversations like this that persist. So let's continue this conversation. I know there are more questions and hopefully we can discuss them um, throughout the rest of our meeting. I want to thank our panelists so much for their deep insights and really thoughtful discussion today. Thank you, thank you, and please join me. See you at the breakout side.